uh, two presentations back to back. This is uh, 8421, detail our design. Did you get one? No, no, I don't need one. Okay. To the panelists, just this morning's presentations were all first semester premium design. Uh, these teams, this one and the one at 1145, have both been through prelim. And now they're in the detail no. part. They're finishing Your up. This is the last deliverable of their course. Uh, both teams uh, were building and designing airplanes to respond to an RFP. It was a competitive uh, effort. Both teams did really, really well in the competition. Uh, and in spite of the spirited nature of the competition, they actually did a lot of crossing over. And there was a lot of collaboration going on across teams. Uh, a lot of mentoring going on, and uh, I applaud both teams for, for doing that. They did a great job in that. So uh, I'm going to get off the stage here, but uh, I guess what I'd like to do is have each of you introduce yourselves to uh, the team so that they can know who you are, what your background is, and then, uh, then we'll get started. Okay, so with you, Chris. Go ahead. All right. Hi, I'm Chris Liebman. Uh, I think it's good to see you again. I think I saw you from the last time. Um, so graduated Prescott in 06, Aeronautical Science and Aerospace Engineering. Uh, played flight instructor at the flight line for three years, uh, and then uh, went over to Edwards Air Force Base and uh, playing engineer over there. So uh, started with the F-16 squadron, doing uh, flying qualities, flight controls kind of stuff. Um, worked on the staff at the test pilot school for uh, about four years. Uh, went through test pilot school as a student, uh, and then I uh, currently work with the F-22 squadron uh, as a flight dynamics, uh, flight controls uh, kind of lead. So performance, flying quality structures, Propulsion, all those different things, kind of wrapped in. So. Hello, uh, I'm Eli Jones. I uh, also work at Edwards Air Force Base. Um, I graduated uh, Riddle in 05 as an AD. Uh, and after graduation, I went to work for NAVAIR at Pack River in Maryland, working on Super Hornet uh, and Legacy Hornet uh, weapons integration mostly. And uh, there at uh, when I was at Pack River, I went through Navy TPS and then the F 35 program. I uh, got on that, and that brought me out to Edwards. Uh, I worked on the F 35 program for a while. Uh, went to teach at uh, Air Force uh, Test Pilot School as well, and now I'm at F 22 with uh, Chris uh, as the mission assistant. For the Martin Martinez, resident old guy. I uh, graduated from University of Arizona eight years ago, and uh, my background is pretty much aerospace and defense. I started off over what we used to call Garrett Air Research in Beach, Arizona after graduate U of A and uh, started moonlighting actually for a semiconductor when I was there and started my own company called ESA. So I am the ringleader of that company right now. We pretty much do work for everyone and anyone, be it Raytheon, be it Helicopter, be it Boeing, you name it. Most of ours is uh, product development and it's heavily on design and simulation. And right now, things are just pulling up and uh, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Kenton Purcell. Um, I'm by far the junior member on the panel in terms of experience. I was in your guys' shoes a year ago. So I uh, graduated from Ember Riddle in May, but I did my detail project um, last last December. So uh, I've been working at Raytheon Missile Systems since June, and I'm working on a redesigned kill vehicle, an exo-atmospheric kill vehicle. Uh, for anti-ballistic missile systems, and I'm a systems engineer. Uh, so right now I've been doing a lot of requirements, verification, decomposition, requirements management, um, and also right now we're working on transitioning over to flight test systems engineering, and working on writing requirements and con ops and stuff for flight test stuff, so. <laughs> yes, very much so. Hi, I'm Gary Cosentino. <clears throat> I've got 30 plus years with NASA, and uh, in the last 21 years, I've spent a lot of time at Edwards Air Force Base flight testing UAVs. So we're very interested to see um, UAV and your flight test results. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Emily. I'm the design team lead. Uh, and we just appreciate you all being here for our presentation. Um, I'm going to introduce the rest of the team to you. We have Chase Pilyu working on mass properties, Scott Bragg, who is our production lead and our test pilot, um, Zach Graber, our production assistant, Megan Riley, our supply chain lead, David Sanders on the performance and systems teams, Joshua Warshaw, our performance lead, and finally Kyle West, our chief engineer. Uh, 
the purpose of this briefing today is to review our wind tunnel testing results and the um, resulting di design updates, report on our flight test results, and finally to seek approval to build a second flight test prototype. So Housing Natural Gas Company um, came to Eagle Eye with a request for a proposal for a fully autonomous aerial vehicle to inspect their, sec their segment of pipeline running from Tucson, Arizona to El Paso, Texas. The need for this grew largely out of unauthorized activities such as illegal pipeline tapping in the vicinity or along the pipeline um, on the U.S.-Mexican border. In addition, the, air the UAV is to be used for preventative maintenance. This image on the slide here shows an incident in New Mexico where a pipeline exploded due to corrosion and killed 12 people and resulted in a cost of upwards of $100 million for El Paso Natural Gas. So um, the accident was attributed to their lack of a corrosion control plan being implemented. So this UAV will be um, used to look for spots where preventative maintenance measures can be implemented. So the surveyor is our response to the request for proposal. It is a fully autonomous unmanned aerial vehicle. It takes off from a parking lot. It is controlled on takeoff um, by a pilot through a satellite receiver. Once it is in the air, it switches to fully autonomous flight where it is guided along the pipeline route by a GPS waypoint system. Throughout the flight, the surveyor transmits a live video feed to an operator on the ground. And in the event that the operator would like to see something on the pipeline they would like to inspect further, they can activate the loiter mode, in which case the aircraft will circle in the current area so that the operator can get a better view of the pipeline. Um, finally, landing is controlled by a pilot through the satellite receiver in a very similar manner to take off. These are some of the main requirements for a full scale system. Uh, a range of 260 nautical miles and endurance of six hours. The takeoff and landing distances of less than 500 feet so that it can be um, operated from a parking lot so it can take off and land in a parking lot. Um, it is expected to operate in the environment typical that you would see between Tucson and El Paso um, and it needed a takeoff weight of less than 55 pounds. Here's a surveyor overview. Um, its weight was 45 pounds. It had a, a range of 40, 445 nautical miles and endurance of over six hours. It has a straight tapered wing with an SD6080 airfoil, uh, a -tail, um, an A-tail configuration with a NACA 0012 airfoil, and the tail is supported by twin booms. Uh, it has a standard tricycle landing gear, and it is gas powered. Here's a preview of the vehicle. Um, as I mentioned, the weight is 45 pounds, the wingspan is just over 11 and a half feet, and the total length of the aircraft is 7.7 feet. So I'll pass it off to Josh to discuss our wind tunnel test. Thank you very much. To compare our theoretical values with realistic data, we conducted a wind tunnel test to retrieve all of our static stability derivatives. The test was conducted here in Prescott with ambient air. The wind tunnel was run at 25 meters per second, we let our angle of attack range from negative six degrees to 20 degrees, with side slip ranging from zero degrees to 15 degrees. We also taped tufts onto the wings and, and the tail to observe flow visualization. After, <laughs> After conducting a linear regression on the data, we retrieved that our, co our pitch moment coefficient with respect to angle of attack was negative and that was considered stable. Our roll moment coefficient with respect to side slip was negative and that was considered stable. However, our yaw moment with respect to side slip was negative and that was unstable. We looked at our flow visualization and at five degrees we did see some separation due to an adverse pressure gradient and then at 15 degrees, it, or 10 degrees, excuse me, it reattached. So we believe that this was due to the fuselage blocking it, causing a turbulent flow, which caused the yaw instability. To account for this, we also made a design change. We decided to increase the span and the height, both by 15%. So the span increased from 3.25 to 3.74 feet, and the height changed from 1.63 feet to 1.87 feet. I'll now pass it back to Emily for the subscale vehicle. Thank you, Josh. So after reviewing our wind tunnel data and looking at the performance and stability characteristics of the full scale design, um, we moved into designing a subscale vehicle to be used for flight testing. Um, 
the main requirement that we had for this vehicle was that it needed to be half the weight of the full-scale uh, aircraft that we had designed. So it needed to be 22 and a half pounds um, within 10%. And then it needed a takeoff and landing distance of less than 800 feet. This is a requirement derived from the runway at the flight time, or at the airspace where we did the test. Here's an overview of our flight test article. Um, the geometry scaled down to about 70%, and the final weight was 22.1 pounds. Um, it, had, it has the same geometry as our full scale, as our full scale aircraft, excuse me. However, it has a minimal payload and minimal avionics, and this aircraft is powered by an electric motor. Here's the vehicle preview. As I mentioned, we came in at 22.1 pounds for the flight test. The wingspan is just under eight feet, and the total length of the aircraft was around five and a half feet. For our weight and balance, the aerodynamic center of this aircraft was at 28.2 inches. So with two and a half pounds of ballast, we placed the center of gravity at 25.6 inches to give us a static margin of 30%. I'll pass it off to David to discuss our material testing. So in order to determine the most adequate material for our aircraft, um, our team went through a tensile test, in which case we pulled um, a sample and as far as we could to see when it would break. And so we used two different types of materials, carbon fiber and fiberglass. And these were set in three and laid out in three different separate layouts. And so we have discovered that through our research that the sense to weight ratio of these uh, layups is not necessarily dependent on the number of layers. Therefore, we determined that a two layer carbon fiber layup um, was selected for uh, the wing and the tail, and a two layer uh, fiberglass layup was selected for the fuselage of uh, the skin. Now I'll pass on the, uh, the slide to Zach Graber, who will discuss subscale manufacturing. Thank you. This semester, our aircraft was split into four major components that we had to manufacture. <laughs> the first item we'll be talking about is the fuselage. The fuselage is made out of aluminum components that were all welded together. It contained three bulkheads, two C channels, a floor plate, and two L angles to add rigidity to the floor plate because it was a cantilever beam. And the the skin of the fuselage was made out of fiberglass. Uh, fiberglass was chosen so that the pilot could communicate with the aircraft effectively. Our other option was carbon fiber, which would have blocked the signal. And a two-ply layup was used for the skin. The nose dome was acrylic so that we could attach a camera to the front of to the front bulkhead, and it would be able to see out. And the two C channels, the upper one was used to attach the wing, while the bottom one was used to attach the main landing here. For the wing, it had a carbon fiber spar running the entire span of the wing, and had a carbon fiber layup for the skin that was two ply as well. There were 11 ribs total, four of them were aluminum, the other seven were plywood. The aluminum ribs sandwiched a T-joint that was used to attach the booms that went out to the appanage to the main spar. And it used a foam core out of extruded polystyrene. This was for ease of manufacture as well as to give it the proper shape. The construction of the appanage was very similar to the wing as it had a carbon fiber spar as well as a carbon fiber skin layup with the same layup. There were two plywood ribs, both of them at the base of the empennage, and at the apex of the empennage, there was a uh, wooden dowel that <coughs> fit inside the spar to attach the two halves. And it also had a foam core for manufacturing and the shape. For the landing gear, it was the main gear and the nose gear. The main gear was made from a plate of I'm sorry, a bar of aluminum that was bent into the required shape and then cut down for weight management. And the wheels were purchased. For the nose gear, it was purchased from a local hobby shop for aircraft of a similar weight and size. And the wheel was purchased as well. 
And I'll hand it off to panelists for air cap interfaces. Thank you. So the booms were connected to the wing via aluminum T-joints that were welded from two pipes. Um, and then the empennage was connected to the booms via PVC elbows, giving a margin of safety of 0.08 for the T-joints and 0.2 for the PVC. So the wing was attached to the fuselage via four steel bolts, uh, along with washers on the top and lock washers on the bottom, nylon nuts to attach them. Um, these were considered under the max load factor of 4.5 Gs, and this gave a margin of safety for each bolt of 110. The control surface hinges were tested. Um, they did not fail up to a load of 19 pounds. Um, and because under a max drag analysis, each control surface, each aileron could hold, uh, or was expected to hold 18 pounds, and each rudder bader was expected to hold 22, uh, and there was three on each surface, then they were uh, definitely sufficient, um, giving a margin of safety of 1.1 for the ailerons and 0.7 for the rudder bader hinges. The main gear was attached to the fuselage via four bolts as well, lock washers, nylock nuts, as well as lock tight to seal it in place. Um, this was considered under the max landing load factor of 4.5 as well and each one of these bolts had a margin of safety of around 1300. The motor was connected to the fuselage via four bolts as well, uh, lock washers, nylock nuts, Loctite sealed in place, and this was considered under the max torque of the engine or motor, and uh, as well as the shear loading due to the uh, landing load factor. Uh, this gave a margin of safety for each bolt of 72. And with that, I'll pass it off to Scott Bragg for payload and avionics. Uh, so the, the goal for the payload and avionics was to be as simple as possible and also very closely mimic your standard like RC airplane. Uh, so this is a basic layout. Uh, one servo per control service, including a servo for the steerable nose wheel. We used a 2.4 gigahertz uh, RC protocol to communicate uh, from the ground to the receiver. <coughs> Onboard the aircraft is a Spectrum AR7000 7 channel, uh, giving it uh, enough channels to fly the aircraft. Uh, the receiver also had a satellite receiver that was taped to the bottom of the wing so that, uh, for better reception at various orientations in case something were to block the main receiver. <coughs> uh, we chose an E Flight Power 90 motor, which outputs 1800 watts. Uh, this gives us about 80 watts per pound, which is very industry standard for kind of slow flying, scale flying uh, aircraft with sufficient power. Uh, powered by an 80 amp ESC with a separate BEZ to power the servos. Uh, the, we chose two four cell batteries uh, running in series in lieu of a single eight cell. Four cells are easier and cheaper to find. They're also easier to uh, work with you know, for the resources we had available, especially for charging it. We don't have an eight cell charger, we have plenty of four cell chargers. Um, we had a GoPro Hero Black, <coughs> or GoPro Hero 4 uh, for, the, uh, for actual in flight recording. Free flying schematic. <coughs> uh, so each battery was run in series, uh, outputting roughly 30 volts to the electronic speed control, which controls um, how much current and voltage goes to the, the motor. It also can, uh, converts DC to AC for the motor. Uh, same voltage runs to the BEC battery eliminator circuit, which will step down the voltage and provide uh, enough current for the receiver as well as the servos. And the camera uses its own uh, power source that was independent of the flight batteries. And this, uh, putting this all together, this is what our uh, final design looks like on, on uh, flight test day. Uh, as I mentioned before, I was the flight test pilot. I've been flying RCs for a long time, so it's a pretty good choice. Uh, the flight test consisted of uh, three phases, a, a takeoff phase, taking off east to west, as we had a very downsloping runway, uh, going from east to west, and then the aircraft moved to phase two, which was a maneuverability and instability maneuvering. maneuvering. Uh, phase. So this was to establish steady level, unaccelerated flight, uh, observe things like static stability, overall controllability, and then uh, in this phase we also uh, had impulse inputs to observe uh, static and dynamic stability. And then phase three uh, was, was going to be a landing, either going from west to east or uh, would, would be the preferred way for the upsloping runway, but if winds uh, were different enough we could have gone east to west again. Uh, this is, will be a summary of our flight test results. 
We did achieve takeoff. We got some flying hardware. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a, a brief video of our entire flight. slides are going to be uh, descriptions of why we think this happened. Uh, first and foremost, in my personal opinion, what, what caused it, during actual manufacturing of the wing, we noticed that one wingtip had washout angle while the other one did not. So left wingtip had washout angle while the right one did not. This was just due to our inexperience of working with composites of this size and length and uh, letting it cure improperly. Uh, so this means that the right wing constantly had a higher angle tack, constantly producing more lift. Also means it was closer to its critical angle tack constantly. <clears throat> uh, just focusing on the lift itself, this was just after takeoff. You can see the nearly full deflection of the ailerons was needed just to keep the wings level. Uh, this made it very, very hard to control. Uh, any slight, uh, slightly less input uh, for the ailerons results in a very high bank angle, making it very hard to control, very hard to trim as well, because you use the same hand to control the, the roll as you do to trim the roll, so you can't do both. Uh, it's hard to tell exactly when exactly when this picture was taken, uh, but this was going you know from crosswind to downwind, trying to turn uh, level. <coughs> uh, I think this is right, or this is what actually caused the, the spiral. So, trying to roll wings level, you increase the angle attack on the the right wing. It was already close to its critical angle attack, putting it over its critical angle attack and stalling it. So we have one wing stalled, but the other one was not stalled. Um, so initially, you know, just trying to turn uh, level flight, you have left aileron input, but after the, the spiral develops, it's neutral uh, aileron input to not exacerbate the, the spin anymore, <coughs> just like in full-scale airplanes. Uh, same with the, the rudder, corrective action of, of uh, left rudder, and this picture doesn't show, but also nose down to try to, try to recover. Uh, but you probably could have had the biggest tail in the world and wouldn't have been able to recover this from this altitude, about another 500 feet or so, to be able to recover from that. <coughs> Before that, uh, <laughs> uh, just some overall uh, flight characteristics that I noticed. Uh, it was very, very stable in pitch. I had no problem rotating or on the climb out uh, due to pitch. Uh, I felt it was slightly nose heavy compared to what I would have liked uh, in an airplane. I can read that to a slightly high static margin, but again, certainly not uncontrollable. Uh, what was uncontrollable was the roll. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily unstable, but very hard to control, and it becomes unstable once one of them stalls. <clears throat> I would like to point out that it, it did seem very stable in the off. The, the nose was pointed, it didn't get any kind of fishtailing at any time. Uh, you watch the video again, you see once it starts to spiral, the fuselage still goes in a straight line into the ground. Uh, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a pure rotation about the longitudinal axis. <laughs> I had to be fair. <laughs> We did some risk analysis before building and testing back in the engineering phase. Uh, we created a risk matrix with a whole bunch of different risks we could have run into. Uh, and then we plotted it with the probability that it will occur versus the severity of that occurrence. And then the ones that we saw are circled there, those three. So those three, starting with C, uh, the, wind tunnel, the wind tunnel testing improved instability, so to fix that we just increased our tail size. Uh, the supplier did end up sending us the, the incorrect material. Um, we ordered a certain aluminum and they sent us a different one. We did all of the uh, material testing, we figured out two that it could have been, and both of them were within the tolerances we needed, so we just went ahead and used the one that they did send us. And then the worst one was we lacked manufacturing experience. 
which uh, we tried to combat that before building the actual wing. The team was in AxFab doing uh, practice layups with carbon fiber, getting all getting comfortable with it. Uh, the only thing that we think the main cause was we didn't do anything that was eight foot in size. So the size trying to do that, and uh, when it was so after we wrapped it, when it was drying, it warped a little bit, and that was what caused the crash. So now I'll pass it over to Megan for project management. Oh. Um, so, for our total hours for this semester, we plan to have right around 1,680. 1, um, that was based off of two hours outside of class for every one hour inside of class. Um, and the actual hours we ended up at were close, um, 1,700 just about, we were about 30 hours over. Um, and so, not too far off. Um, and we believe that most of that was just due to our own scheduling, certain cards came in at different times, and so that on top of just the scope of the project some requirements changing at times and not really realizing how long actual manufacturing it would take. Um, and so basically we did stay pretty close on schedule and we did this with our weekly meetings and our status reports. Um, we would report to Emily, our team lead directly, and then she would report to Professor Zwick from there. Um, we also had a production schedule once we began our manufacturing and basically we would come in every day and it would have what was done so far, what we needed to be done that day, and detailed steps on how to do it. Um, and then we split up our team into two teams, actually. So we had one that was strictly just the build team, and we would do all the manufacturing. And the other team was our documentation. And they would do things like our test readiness review and our flight test plan, things like that. And so splitting that up made the work get done pretty easily and simultaneously at the same time. Um, in order to account for our hours, um, basically we summed up the total of all of our different categories, um, which gave us around 1,100. $151,000, um, and that was summed up from these five different categories that we have. So the orange is our engineering management, and that is efforts mostly by um, the detail and other sub-team leads um, in order to manage the entire project. The blue is our engineering and technical work, so basically any calculations, any CATIA work, anything like that. Um, our green is our administration, so any kind of documentation for all of our deliverables. Um, our Yellow is our professional development, so that's most of our time spent in class and any time doing any research, things like that. And lastly, pink is manufacturing. And so, in the beginning of the semester, it was mostly engineering and technical work that was done, and then halfway through, once we began our production, then you saw all the manufacturing hours ramp up. And so basically, this cost, um, for the prompt we were given, it would be um, amortized over 100 full-scale units if we were to move on and actually produce a full-scale vehicle. And so this is the cost of our subscale um, flight test vehicle that we used, our little prototype. And basically the budget we were given was $1,150. Um, the budget we actually ended up spending was um, $703. And so we had 447 left over. And we actually went through um, and did an analysis of what we still had because we did receive um, extra parts, spare parts, um, some, of the, some of the materials that we received were too big. So we have scrap materials that we can still use. Um, and then the salvageable material from our original prototype. Um, good thing most of the electronics actually were still working. Most of the expensive parts were still working. The only thing really is a motor that we would have to buy and a few other parts. And so we can actually create a second prototype with the remaining budget that we have left. And now I hand it off to Emily to do conclusions and recommendations. So to recap the requirement or <coughs> the requirements of our flight test article. Um, the weight was evaluated by tests and it did meet um, the requirement to be with in 10% of 22.5 pounds at 22.1 pounds. The takeoff distance was observed um, off, during the flight test to be about 200 feet so it does meet the 800 feet requirement and the landing distance also observed during test was 60 square feet, so it is well below the 800 feet requirement. Here's a summary of our program to date. We began with the preliminary design that was approved in May. Um, from that design, we did wind tunnel testing and determined our performance and stability characteristics. We increased the tail size by 15% based off of those results. So after iterating through that design update, we move forward with testing of the material to select which materials would be used on the flight test article. After selecting our materials, we did a structural sizing and structural analysis to make sure that we had positive margins for all components of the aircraft.
aircraft. We then held our CDR in which, or as, and as a result, we received approval to begin fabrication of this subscale model. Um, after fabrication of the subscale model, we did a static load test on the wing where we loaded the wing to 80% of the um, expect, or of the limit load, excuse me, um, to preserve the flight test article, but um, it passed the test and we observed minimal deflection on the tip of the wing tip, on the, um, excuse me, on the wing tip. So we moved forward into our flight test. Um, we are currently holding our flight test review. And to move forward from this, we would go ahead and fabricate the second subscale model with our remaining budget. We would conduct the same static load test and flight test that we did with the first prototype model. Um, and then we would hold another flight test review in which case we'd be seeking approval to move forward into the full scale production of survey. So the recommendations moving forward, um, first and foremost to conduct a full scale failure analysis and root cause analysis for the reasons behind uh, the crash. We believe we, we knew it was because of the washout angle of the wing, but we recommend spending a little bit more time on the analysis to find out everything that went wrong and what can be done to correct that in the second prototype. Um, if time allowed, we would like a second round of wind tunnel testing to confirm that the 15% increase in, stale, in the tail, side, tail size excuse me, is enough to correct for the yaw instability that we observed during our first round of wind tunnel testing. Um, then we would move forward with our second prototype model. Using, er, building this prototype model, we would use more stringent manufacturing techniques, more specifically to account for the, the inconsistencies that we saw in the first model. We would use a mold to help cure the wing to make sure that we don't have the variability of washout angle that we saw on the first prototype. So some of the most important lessons that we learned um, communication is paramount. It seems easy and everybody always talks about communication is important, um, but it really is difficult. And I think our team learned this semester that communication is not only giving information, but it is receiving information as well. And so we've come a long way with communication, especially trying to manage a build team, a documentation team. Uh, we, we were able to get that done by growing in our communication. Um, secondly, we, it's really important to utilize the experience of those around you, of those, uh, our, our professors, other professors around the campus, and especially the machinists that we have on campus. They have a lot of really great experience, and they can help um, solve, or just give recommendations, whether it be from design input to manufacturing techniques. Um, it's all really great, so we learned to utilize the people around us that have more experience than we do. Um, accountability is key. Deadlines are important, yes, but deadlines mean nothing if you don't help hold yourself and your team accountable to the deadlines. So that's something that we did struggle with early on in the semester, um, but we kind of turned around and following on with that, attitude can make or break a project. Um, as I mentioned, we did struggle holding ourselves accountable to deadlines at the beginning of the semester. We did a root cause analysis with professors with, and basically what it came down to um, was a less than positive attitude among team members. Um, we had a discussion about it. We realized that we were at rock bottom, so to speak. So we, we had a discussion, we met as a team, and we turned that around. And we came up with our team motto from that, rock, bo rock bottom is a solid foundation. It's on the plane, actually. <laughs> Um, so finally, we have so many people that we'd like to thank for helping us get here. Um, Professor James Helbling for his help with the structural design of our wind tunnel model, making sure that it had enough structural integrity to remain intact during all the loads during wind tunnel testing. Um, Dr. Gordingon and Dr. Morris for their help with our wind tunnel stability model and resizing of our empennage. Dr. Trout for his assistance with our wind tunnel stability and analysis. Um, Dr. Chrysler for his assistance with our wind tunnel testing and Dr. Laney for his assistance with our structural testing. We would like to thank Patrick, Jeff, and Jared and the machine job. They did so much for us. Like I said before, whether it was design recommendations, manufacturing techniques, or actually helping us weld together our fuselage, we definitely would not have made it off the ground without them. So we really appreciate everything they did for us. Um, we'd like to thank May McGindy from the Vision UAV team. She did. She was always around offering to help, and she actually helped us when we were wrapping our wing in carbon fiber. 
Christine, we really appreciate the help that she gave us. Um, as well as Bjorn Vosenden from the Vision UAV team. Um, we consulted him a lot during the design of the subscale model, and he donated a part for our nose wheel as well, to which we are very grateful for. Um, Luke Wiener was our flight test photographer, so all those wonderful pictures you saw of the plane flying and a little bit of it crashing, we can thank him. And finally, the Chino Valley, Chino Valley Model Aviators Club for letting us use their test or for letting us use their field for testing, and the Chino Valley Police Department for coming out to clock our speed with their radar guns. <laughs> uh, this concludes our briefing. Do you have any questions? So, a um, couple, uh, couple overall things. Uh, there were at least two opportunities where you could have had data and shown it and they didn't see it. So, maybe you have backup slides or maybe we can get to it maybe. Uh, but plots with the wind tunnel test. Um, hopefully, you've got like data points and you can actually show the linear regression. We have those. Okay. Um, that would have been awesome to show. Okay. Uh, if you have it, I'd love to see it. Um, but um, that would be that would be really helpful because it you know it's so um, uh, I think it's actually down the down the street at NASA. It's uh, in God we trust all other spring data. Um, <laughs> uh, that would be really helpful. Uh, I want to believe your results, but I also want to see them myself. Um, so uh, question with your wind tunnel testing. Um, do, what kind of confidence do you have in the wind tunnel results? Uh, did you do multiple runs uh, to you know prove that those really are the right numbers? That sort of thing. Can you expand on that a little? Yeah. So <clears throat> specifically, we did do you know, several runs of, of each test, and there was no huge inconsistencies. Uh, so we it was at least uh, precise, if not accurate. Yep. Um, with any kind of wind tunnel testing, uh, it's not necessarily accurate. Our Reynolds number is is way off, so we can get overall trends. I uh, you know, it's not accurate, but helpful. Sure. Um, that would that would also be a great thing to mention. If you're doing multiple runs, then not necessarily a statistical. Um, you can't necessarily make statistical statements right off the bat, but you can at least feel good that you did it more than once. Uh, so recommend you, you do that uh, in the future. Um, also, if you can prove that it actually is a linear that linear regression makes sense rather than some kind of weird curve. Um, that you can also prove that with the dots, uh, right. the data points. Um, same thing with the static loads test. Um, would have loved to see some data, um, or at least a picture of the aircraft passing, you know, with sandbags uh, uh, packed on top or something like that. Um, so that would be that that would be something I, I recommend adding. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, a little bit more question oriented. Um, in terms of uh, what were your, I, I guess, what were your flight test objectives? What were you specifically trying to gather? Uh, get hardware off the ground. Literally, that's what it was. It was okay. a, a proof of concept. Uh, it was given you know, by a professor saying, have flying hardware by the end of the semester kind of thing. Okay. Uh, it is something different. Not a lot of teams get to actually work on, you know, a lot of teams just get to build a, uh, a wind tunnel model, and, and that's sure. it. And you're, you're gonna actually get to work with hardware, get, get actually into the production phase. Yeah, is what would be my guess of actually. Uh, can you go to slide 38 in your, in your presentation? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that's an awesome first objective. Uh, you can also have more technical objectives, uh, and you kind of acknowledged it. So phase two stability tests, um, phase one takeoff. <coughs> you kind of broke it out by phase of flight, mm -hmm. but you can probably articulate specific things that you want to calculate or specific qualitative uh, aspects that you're trying to measure. Um, I would have liked to have seen, because it turns out in your, in your verification at the end um, that you said you met your takeoff distance. Um, that would have been great to talk about here, the fact that you're trying to gather takeoff distance data. 
Um, and since you happen to have the police department, I don't know if you got to take off speed, but if you, guess, if you gathered that data, it would have been great to it would have been great to show it. Okay. Um, so you kind of set your objectives, say what you're going to get, and then show us how you know which data you gathered. And some tests you're never going to get the data, and that's okay. Um, it just that particular test objective maybe won't be met. No big deal. You didn't fail. It just means that you need to do another play. Yeah. Go get that particular piece of data. So you end up basically having uh, you know a whole bunch of check squares. And did we meet the test? You know, did we get? Did we do enough testing in takeoff distance? Yes. Okay. Did we do enough testing in takeoff speed? Yes, and you go right down the list of every single thing that you're trying to gather. So that would be kind of a way to organize your tests just a little bit more. Um, can help. Uh, I'm trying not to take all the time. Um, <laughs> no look approach. Uh, that's my last question. So, um, did you do any buildups, or was the flight the very first thing you did after you started the motor? Um, in terms of Flight control checks, high speed taxis, low speed taxis. Yeah, so we uh, in our flight off the ground and come right back. We didn't do that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, but in, in our flight test car, we did you know a full kind of pre-flight control check run ups. Uh, things like that, ran the motor up, make sure that it actually did run up, didn't throw another magnet kind of thing, make sure all the control surfaces were in the right, uh, you know, were deflecting uh, correctly. We did um, we did a, a, a low speed taxi test the night before, then a high speed taxi test on the actual runway, oh, and then cool. came back did it again. Okay. Um, those would all be great things to acknowledge, um, and really what that ends up building is that actually builds your safety plan. Because okay. system maturity and readiness to test is absolutely one of the ways that you establish that you're safe. Um, also, the fact that you were flying over an unpopulated area is probably pretty good. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, truly, really that's why at the airport is in the middle of freaking nowhere. Because then we can do that kind of stuff and it's safer. We also so, had all the other modelers who were flying land and, and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So th those are <laughs> those are awesome. Those are awesome things, and you can, uh, if you acknowledge them, then you can kind of get credit for them. Okay. Um, so uh, great job, guys. Yeah, uh, I'll take a lot of what Chris said. Uh, great job getting to a flying vehicle, uh, even if it's for a short while. It's, uh, <laughs> not for BMP, uh, so I applaud you guys for for uh, all the hard work uh, that you did. Uh, your presentation was great. Um, Crystal, all my flight test questions, so um, I'll focus in on a few other things. So you talked a little bit about the instability that you found in the wind tunnel, and, and then at the end said that you would have gone back to the wind tunnel. Why um, was that a conclusion sort of after the fact, um, or did you guys consider going back to the wind tunnel earlier in the redesign? We definitely um, would have liked to go back to the wind tunnel with an updated design before we started building the subscale model but the program schedule just did not allow for that kind of time in order to get um, the, what used to be a flying model together. Um, by the end of the semester, we just didn't have the time in our schedule to go back into the wind tunnel. Gotcha. All right, well then that, that's a great recommendation uh, at the end to realize that, that uh, you need to do that. Um, again, all of this wind tunnel and all of this is built up to you know, the flying vehicle, so um, it just answers uh, incremental questions along the way. Um, you talked a little bit about um, the comps for the airplane, uh, that you were going to use a satellite receiver to take off and then let the airplane fly around autonomously. Um, so, uh, and then uh, in your actual vehicle that you built, you mentioned that you put a satellite receiver on it. Can you explain a little bit more? Yeah, so different, that was more? Yeah, di different so in, the, in the full scale of the satellite being like GPS kind of satellites, like a uh, like predator drone kind of satellite, because that's the only thing that gets that range. The, the set, so satellite receiver in this company's thing is just a separate receiver, you know, a, a, a diversity receiver almost, that just runs somewhere else in the airplane. So if the main receiver gets blocked somehow, it, it's, it's not like space satellite receiver kind of thing. I see, okay. It might still be attached. Okay, yeah, that makes <laughs> a little bit, because yeah, when I think satellite receiver, I'm thinking that you're getting like downlink from. Yeah, no, I, I didn't think of that, and, and, but if you're, if you're not familiar with, with really that, that company is what they call a satellite receiver, that was going called diversity receivers. Gotcha, okay, that, that makes sense. Um, we have a picture. Yeah, it, is it your intent in the CONOPS to um, not you know, operate the vehicle the way that you guys did in your test? Um, what's, what's the intent to use a satellite in, in the full scale, yeah, uh, but that the, the whole like payload, it, everything else besides the actual uh, flying aircraft was out of the scope of, of uh, what we were doing sure. for the half scale. 
is it just a common RC airplane sure. after that? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, yeah, just a, a word of caution there, right? You can imagine there's tons of latency with controlling an uh, air vehicle right. uh, with a satellite. <laughs> so uh, critical phases of flight typically, right, are not done through a satellite link. Uh, so just uh, maybe a, a slight edit to your count ops there um, for some sort of ground-based um, manual style takeoff or even autonomous takeoff um, is possible, but satellite uh, latency for takeoff and landing. This will be my last question. Uh, I noticed that you guys had uh, different sized wheels, and uh, can you talk about why they were different? Was that intentional, or was that <laughs> you get your hands on? Um, basically, there was there were set heights uh, that we had as our targets for each gear, and we purchased a strut for the nose gear and found out it was really short. So we basically intentionally bought a big tire to add height. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I got. <laughs> the whole idea is off the shelf kind of thing. Uh, so it's gotcha. Sure. Well, Do you think that had any impact on your takeoff distance? Not as much as the fact that like the takeoff distance was uh, calculated as okay, full throttle right away and then go. In actuality, uh, I do this very slow throttle up to make sure we can track center line. Um, and you know, try to make it safe and then rotation. Sure, and that, that kind of goes to a little bit of Chris's point about laying out your test objectives. And important to laying out test objectives, like measuring takeoff distance, uh, is important on how you're going to do it, right? Like, um, you're going to get a vastly different uh, takeoff distance with a slow throttle up than you would with you know, perhaps a, a, a quicker throttle, throttle response. Mm -hmm. um, and then how you're actually going to take the measurement, right? Like, are you going to station? So laying all that out ahead of time and, and briefing how you did it um, would, I think, add a lot of value to the, the confidence in your data, how okay. much tolerance is in that number of people. So, yeah, yeah add to that, uh, we do have a flight test plan that describes basically what you were uh, sizing over here. Um, and I believe we did mention the takeoff distance, but that was from, we didn't, we didn't think we would have to use a soft throttle up. Okay. For, and we also did measure like how far it did take off. So. Yeah, well, that, that's great that you guys have the test plan. Um, all, all good flight tests have the test plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's great. All right, thanks. Yeah, okay. okay, these guys won't see it. You guys will take the lights to see you with what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> but I did like in the beginning, you had a very good compelling statement of need in that image and everything. Like that. that it burned kind of tells you what the problem is right off the top. <laughs> and then uh, I like what we did say the requirements in the beginning, but I didn't see anything about the number of costs. What was the cost of the Did so I miss it right at the beginning? Because or, ordinarily at the beginning you want to see, like, here's where we want to be. We have it in our appendix. We right. broke down mostly from, like, what we were going to do for yeah. our manufacturing, so we didn't have it. But at the end of the day, it's almost just one line. Good for, okay. yeah, just good for so basically what we were trying to do um, with our full-scale model was come in for less than the price of a Cessna, what was it, running right. 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 um, And um, basically, yeah, that's and, what. If, and if you would put that like right at the beginning, mm -hmm. that would be like, bam, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we know you got it, but I'm just like, okay, so I'm going to be nitpicky on this stuff. It's almost like, I'm the guy who's buying it. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Okay. It could be that way, because those are the guys that usually control the first one. Those are the guys you got to try to sell. Them. And uh, let me see, a little bit more detail on the show testing installation. And actually, it's just, Comment on everything. Um, it's good that you have the requirements matrices right at the front, right? Here's what we're trying to go for. But it also is good to, to have one for each section. And this was one line of test. You know, they're telling you give you the test plan on that, but like the requirement matrix for each section is divided for each section. <coughs> I saw it on some, but not all. But that kind of like lays it down. Here's how we met it. No more questions. Be quiet, everyone. You know, you answer all the questions. <laughs> at the end, the fewer questions you ever get, the better. You know, presentation can pretty much answer everything. Let me see. There was a little bit, a little more than a Safety margins, on some of you did say, here's how I calculated. On some, you did. And ordinarily, you're like, okay, where did they get this massive safety number? I don't know how you got it, what you did. Just back to, you know, 
Yeah, you don't have to answer it at all. So, <laughs> it doesn't happen. Okay? Yeah, it's, it's in the appendix. So. And, and the thing is, the, the fact that it crashed, forensic experience is always good as long as it's not your stuff. You know? <laughs> 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 I'm just saying, it's very my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but one thing that really, I always keep saying one thing, it's never one thing, but when it comes to the, uh, when you ran the wins on this, why was not the AOA even, why didn't it come up on that one? Is there a reason? Is it not the same aircraft? It wasn't the, it's not clear to me. Um, it was the same sort of, it was the same aircraft scaled down, but I think so that, was. I think it would have been um, stable in role, just we weren't capable of manufacturing a wing right. that met the same, the same, um, I guess, precision that the wind tunnel model was, okay, so the wind tunnel was 3D printed. Right, so wind tunnel model. Also, it is stable in role, just not controlled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it did respond to control inputs. Now, the, the whole, there's another thing here that I'd like to, to actually, uh, this, this goes towards Embry Red. <laughs> I always like to, uh, I always do this for ASU as well. So it, it's kind of like to help them help you so that when I hire you, I don't have to teach you anything else. Uh, from a manufacturing standpoint, it'd be neat if they had some kind of a best practice for when you're manufacturing these sort of structures. So you guys don't have to figure out you have hands full of this stuff. You're not manufacturing it, you're, you're trying to design it. Yeah. So at the end of the day, if they did have a way to capture this stuff, if you guys decide to come up with the design is too big, they would know, hey, these guys tried it before, don't do it, or do it this way. That, that could perish. It's noted. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I think also if we had had um, a previous class where we had this type of manufacturing, manufacturing experience or just more time in our schedule to give ourselves more practice before manufacturing the full thing. Yeah, but it's, you know, like I said, you've got your hands full trying to calculate yeah. all this, get all this stuff done and you know, trial and error on getting <clears throat> up stuff. Yeah. I'm not going to hire you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just not. No. I mean, it is fun. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It is fun to do stuff like that, but it's you weren't taught to do it. And you already showed how much everything costs. You already showed your schedule. And this really isn't part of it. My turn? Okay. Systems engineer here. So I'm going to come and ask about your requirements and some system level stuff. Um, but first of all, some general comments. Uh, you guys did a really good job with the presentation. You were confident. You um, knew where your shortfalls were as a team. You expressed that. You showed how you would uh, rectify them you know, with more future work. And you guys had a flight failure. And you guys formulated the plan to you know, rectify that as well. So I think that you guys made a lot of progress as a team, um, <clears throat> as a general comment. Um, Okay, so uh, slide five, your guys' con ops. Okay, so um, I just made one of these for a very complex system, but I see a lot of systems inside of the system of systems that you guys are working with. Um, it's an excellent con ops. I think it's easy to read and it's pretty, which is great because this is the sort of thing that they use for like marketing or socializing with the customer. Um, some, some suggestions. <clears throat> The things I would add is add some arrows to show the interactions between the different systems. So if you have a satellite signal incoming to the um, vehicle, show that the path. Um, the operator, when it's in non-autonomous mode, show that there is an operator controlling the vehicle during those phases of flight. You don't want to have anything in a concept of operations be uh, ambiguous because <clears throat> Ambiguity when you're trying to present something to the customer can push the customer out of scope of what they had originally given you. So it's kind of opening your guys' um, your guys' self up to things in the future that you uh, might not want to deal with. Um, and I'm talking from experience. That does open the can of worms. It does. <laughs> so um, less questions, less questions. Yeah, especially when the government's directly involved. That's even worse. Yes, in contracts. So uh, let's go to slide six for your guys' requirements. <clears throat> so I know these were given to you guys by your stakeholder, Professor Zwick. Um, so did you guys do any requirements decomposition from this to trade study your guys' design? Or like, how, how did you guys come to your design solutions if, if you guys didn't have decomposition? Yeah, like, 
I believe that we did do multiple trade studies, and uh, Josh and Josh and several other members of the team, along with me, we, we all worked on, on specific uh, concepts that we would add. For example, a uh, study on the landing gear and how much drag and whether that's cost effective or not, so that they can either um, retractable or whatever, or not have it at all just launched off of off the platform. But yeah, we did have uh, trade studies, but we did have limited amount of material what we could put in these. So, of course. So, okay, so those might be something that would be good for backup slides. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're up, so I'm going to give you guys a time check here. Yeah. We've got about five minutes left for questions. We've got one more guy to ask some questions, so let's. Uh, uh, right. Right. One more. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then the flight test stuff, um, since I'm starting to do this sort of thing too, uh, in industry, um, did you guys have any, like, if you guys are going to do a second flight test, telemetry, a data recorder, so you can understand when, like, inputs, control inputs were. Corroborated with video. Yeah, so I, I would have well, also the GoPro didn't work because of the crash. It kind of corrupted the file. Okay. Like that that data was. Lost. <laughs> um, I, I also would have loved to have like, uh, if you've seen those boxes where like you're holding the control right here and there's a camera showing the control input, you can do like a, a, a time slap to or a sound slap to, you know, mark it. Okay, what was the control input versus the the output on the airplane kind of thing? Absolutely. I would have loved to have done something like that. Okay. Uh, to, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, telemetry would have definitely would have been cool too. And uh, the same, the same kind of um, comment that the, the, the first two uh, panelists had is, is driven by requirements for your guys' flight test plan. Um, having a list of firsts for what you guys were going to be doing and why, uh, these are sort of things that a stakeholder wants to see when you did a flight test. Um, and, and then you know, comparing that to when did things start going wrong in the phases, uh, that, that sort of thing can help uh, decompose what went off model. But otherwise, I really like that you guys went through the pictures and showed, you know, what happened, the different phases in your guys' flight with the um, animations. So overall, great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So <clears throat> as a flight test guy, and especially making go or no go decisions, I'm interested in, I think you knew about the uh, uneven washout before the flight. So what what was the discussions concerning what you might encounter and what what you might best do to try to keep it a successful flight? Yeah, it, it was hard to estimate the uh, overall impact of how much of that washout was going to create that much of a, of a roll moment kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, to help counter that, we also oversized our ailerons uh, by a fair amount. So looking at the, you know, it was discussing here. Um, but you know, looking at what our scale design would have been, you know, that they, they were excellent, and then you know, if, if it was a perfect mold and, uh, and you know, production airplane, that would have been fine. But given our manufacturing experience, and we just wanted bigger elements for more control, because uh, if, if they were if they weren't that size, we probably wouldn't have been able to, to even roll right kind of at all. So that's the only counter. The if we had you know an actual uh, time, and if this was actually going to be like a, a real airplane that could hurt someone. We would have actually made all together, made a new one. Right. Um, but ultimately, it was a low risk kind of thing. With it, it was an RC airplane. Right. The last thing, <clears throat> uh, if you wanted to sell this and go into full scale production, I didn't see anything about how you could take your results here and tell a customer, yes, the full scale will meet these requirements based on this data. I didn't see a transference from subscale results, even best case, to how you could sell a customer on the full scale. And I wondered if you looked at that. Um, so we didn't test the subscale for any other range or endurance requirements because we had obviously an electric motor and batteries instead of, or instead of a gas engine. Um, we, it was mostly just to prove it can fly can get off the ground. Um, we wanted to uh, meet the weight requirement, even though it was a half half of the weight requirement. Um, a lot of the materials that we used in the fabrication of this were the same as the, as the full scale. Um, for example, the spar, the skin on the wings, um, the carpet fiber booms, things like that. So to prove that um, those could handle in 
bike loans. Also to add on that, one of our recommendations that we talked about after this was that the we wouldn't be, um, I guess, asking for permission to move forward to build a full scale yet. We, we understand that. No one is gonna, yeah. no one takes <laughs> that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go Give us that money to build full scale yeah. hundred yeah. units. So um, our recommendation <laughs> was that we would build a second prototype first, and then from there, hopefully we'd get a little more data that we could actually use to push towards a full scale model. Fair enough, thanks. Do you have any questions? Do we have time? Um, I think a couple minutes. All right. Um, uh, overall, good job, guys. Um, from a personal standpoint, I've pretty much watched your entire tenure here, so uh, it's been quite a transformation for every one of you. So, all right, now the ass casing is out of the way. <laughs> How did you manage a BMC rollover with a single engine aircraft? <laughs> 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 that was rhetorical. Um, uh, Skill. The, the panel asked most of your questions, but that the, the last the last question was what has been on my mind the entire time, which was how did this test get green lighted when angle of attack range is like what twenty degrees maximum for full deflection, and you can visually see the ch the difference in angle of attack. Um, uh, so I guess. I know it was asked, and I know it was kind of answered. I just want to know, what, what, what were your heads looking higher than this moment as your goalpost? What was your thinking moving forward? What would you have done if this were an actual engineering environment? You're engineers now. Your decision making is, is, is relied upon to make decisions higher up the chain so that stuff like this doesn't happen. So, was that also important? <laughs> <laughs> did you guys want to form a flight review? Yes. 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 Okay. Was that the slide deck? No. 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 Okay. Also good to mention. Yeah. <laughs> that, that definitely should have been right before your guys' flight test um, stuff. I mean, yeah. yeah. Especially when you've got bad result. When the test doesn't end uh, the way you want it. You need to kind of illustrate to the audience the whole process that you went through in the build-up of here's all the steps we attempted to take to be safe, and still something bad happened. But at least give us, you know, you, the panel can give you credit for all of the build-ups that you did if you talk about it. Okay. I think if we had more time, we would have uh, done a really, really thorough test readiness review and seen that it's not ready, and we wouldn't have done the test. Did the test readiness review include like a design verification where you actually looked at and you're like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> um, did did you form get a chance to do that? We, or, I guess a model verification is probably. Weird. We did not. So that's there was a the so part of the TRR process is to conduct a physical configuration audit uh, of the airplane as built and compare it with the TDP. Okay. Um, neither team. Did that? I mean, it was just time okay. constraints, right? Yeah. You know, uh, but it was a requirement. It wasn't done, so you know that's this is the kind of thing that happens. So yeah, that's the whole objective of that TR is to look at the suitability of the test article for the flight test, and um, neither team did that. So. Yep. Just one more quickie. There are things in your flight or in your wind tunnel test that are screaming at you that says you've got problems. So when you have this tail that stalls at five degrees beta, but then reattaches at 10, and you blame it on the fuselage, uh, is the fuselage in yaw, is it stabilizing or destabilizing? You got this big tubular fuselage out there. Is that gonna push the nose in the opposite direction? Oh, yes it is, because you got a stagnation point on that side. When you got a beta angle, you got a stagnation point on that right side, it's gonna push that nose the other way. Big time. So your wind tunnel data, there's a lot in your wind tunnel data that's screaming at you going, okay. It was still stable. Say <laughs> <laughs> it again? It, it felt very stable in your, in your actual flight test. Yeah, but you don't know what caused it because all the lateral directional terms are linked. So it might have been you, you might have said, well, it was roll that caused you to depart, but it might have been yaw that caused the roll that caused you to depart as well. Further testing required. Yeah. <laughs> All right.
right, so we have about five minutes before the next presentation. I'm going to let the panelists take a quick break, write down your final comments, and then we'll get ready for the next presentation at 11.45.